Welcome to the 10th episode of the ongoing series, The Ten Lost Tribes in Jewish Consciousness, here on Sparm Chatter. I'm Nachi Weinstein. In this episode of the series, we once again will return to the figure of Antonio de Montezinos, Aaron Halevi, and his relation, as relayed by the Menashe ben Israel in his Mikveh Israel, the Hope of Israel, Esperanza de Israel. And this episode is, so there is overlap, definitely, with the previous episode, but it also focuses a little bit more on the broader context of the Relacion and of the Montezinos. Before the next episode, we'll move on to Menashe himself and his work. Uh, additionally, I'll mention here that there will be another episode later this week, uh, which will be on about Lechem Aponim, and you can stay tuned for that. That has to do with this week's parasha, Parashas Emmer. The corporate sponsor of this series, as always, Glock Plumbing. For all your service needs, big or small in New Jersey, with a full service division from boiler replacements, main sewer lines, stankouts, cameraing main lines, to a simple faucet leak, Glock Plumbing Service Division has you covered. Give them a call, 732-523-1836, extension 1. To sponsor an individual episode of this series or of the podcast, you can check out the links and the information in the show's notes below. You can also check out links to the Svarim Chatter Substack, and if you would like to submit an essay, you can do so as well. You can email me. Um, you can also check out links to the Svarim Chatter YouTube as well as the Svarim Chatter WhatsApp chat, where it's just an admin-only chat where I post many new uh, Svarim books and all that uh, kind of thing. I still do that on Twitter or X, but more there's much more on the uh WhatsApp chat. And finally, uh, you can please subscribe, rate, or review the podcast. I appreciate that wherever you listen to your podcast, but especially um, on Apple, you can uh, review and rate. Also, I want to mention one new feature uh, that now is, uh, you can see in the show's notes, you'll see questions, comments, feedback, send us a message. It's the first thing. It's a, a hyperlink. You can click it. It'll take you to send a text message from your phone. You can send a message, and that way you can just you could still send an email or found the WhatsApp chat send the WhatsApp to me, but you can do so that way, and I'll get the message through the uh, through the podcast. So if you have any feedback or comments you want to leave it, you can leave it that way. And uh, with that, enjoy the episode. Hi everyone, welcome to another edition of this Farm Chatter podcast. On this episode of the podcast, and another episode in the ongoing series in the uh, to the uh, Ten Lost Tribes in Jewish Consciousness. Uh, I'll be joined by Professor Jonathan Schorsch, who holds the chair in Jewish Religious and Intellectual History at the University of Potsdam in Germany, and he's the author of a number of books. And uh, we'll be talking about uh, Antonio de Montezinos, Arna Levy, and the Relacion. Uh, this is uh, something that uh, Professor Schorsch has a, I would say a chapter, but it's like 100 pages. It's almost like its own book in one of your books, right. I think. Right. It's, uh, it's pretty long. So we'll be discussing him and the Relacion. And, and, more than with Professor Ronnie Perellis, we also discussed this topic, but this is more about the context of the Relacion and Montezinos and his world and that type of thing. So thank you, Professor Schorsch, for joining me. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. So let's start, start off. Tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and your background. Myself and my background. I grew up in New York. Uh, I still feel very much like a New Yorker. Uh, I went to SAR Academy, uh, went to Bronx High School of Science, went to Columbia University. Many years later, ended up teaching at Columbia for uh, nine years. Uh, I've been in Berlin now for seven years. Um, my father is a well is a historian who's retired and, and a rabbi. And interestingly, given that I'm back in Germany or back in Germany, whatever that means, <laughs> uh, my grandfather was a rabbi uh, of the conservative movement, although it wasn't called that at the time. Back in in Germany before fleeing in uh, in the late 30s. So, yeah. Uh, I feel very blessed to, to have this history, and I guess where I ended up is not so surprising, given that. <laughs> so your books, you, you, I, I, mean, I think one of the books is Swimming the Christian Atlantic. You have a bunch of books on, on these topics of conversos and different, uh, different topics in the area in the Atlantic. So it's not German, not German history. How did you get to become interested in this history? Right. Excellent question. It's not German Jewish history, although it's, it's more uh, similar than I might have imagined. Uh, so my master's degree, uh, my master's thesis and my PhD dissertation were both on uh, the relationship between Jews and blacks, mostly in the colonial world, mostly outside of the United States. And um, most of the Jews in, in that equation were Sephardic Jews. So that was sort of the way I got to talking about Sephardic Jews and conversos. I think I also imagined that somehow 
dealing with Sephardic Jews would be a welcome respite from the stiff uh, yekes, you know, and the the arrogant, uh, self-important yekes. But in fact, uh, my Sephardim, the Western Sephardim, are very, very similar to the yekes. They're sort of like yekes, you know, in advance, you know. Um, very similar. Very, They're very proud. They're very, uh, you know, they romanticize and they're very proud of their glorious history and they they don't they see themselves as very different than those lowly ashkenazim and and polacks you know who are barely civilized and so yeah so it's it's sort of these are not the sfardim i deal with in the atlantic world which i find fascinating um are very different than the eastern sfardim you know the the balkan the balkan and the north african sfardim so yeah it's interesting now, how about Montezinos? Let's just jump right into Montezinos. Uh, the chapter in your book is called, the title is Rereading, Re, or, uh, the R.E.s in parentheses, uh, Reading or Rereading right, yes. the Old Slash New World in the 1640s, the Relacion of Antonio de Montezinos. How, how did you become interested in Montezinos and in the Relacion? Well, he fits right into so much of what's going on in the Atlantic world at the time, and, and which I just find fascinating. Uh, you know the whole history of the conversos, right? The you know the Inquisition, the the the, the rise of worsening anti-Judaism or anti-Semitism, depending on which term you want to use. Uh, the 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 invention of of new Christians, you know, the invention of these converted Jews, starting go as far back as 1390 uh, and the massacres of that year, uh, and then the 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 creation of this entire population of of crypto. Um, you know, crypto Jews, people who are ostensibly on the surface Catholics, but who have all kinds of different Jewish background and knowledge and loyalties. Uh, so that whole history and, you know, the 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 Spanish Jews who flee over the mountains to Portugal after 1492, and then the Portuguese king who converts the entire Jewish population of his realm in one fell swoop at the point of a sword, you know, in one moment uh, in 1497. So that you have this bizarre, you know, really surreal situation of of an entire na- nation's Jews who are now declared Catholic, uh, and and the resulting uh, confusion and consequences of that, among other things, that that the fact that you have this entire community converted at once means that now suddenly, you know, the butcher is now suddenly Catholic, the rabbi is suddenly Catholic, the chazan is suddenly Catholic, so. It, and then, you know, the Portuguese king gives them a grace period of 50 years, says, I'm not going to bring the Inquisition. I'm going to give you, you know, time to become good Catholics, which, of course, did the opposite. It gave them 50 years to sort of continue their confused crypto life. And uh, and then you have many of them, you know, uh, filtering out of Portugal to the colonies, Brazil, among other places. And you have the creation of, you know, they flee elsewhere to uh, Northern and Western Europe. So you have the creation of new Jewish communities, which which hadn't existed in these lands, the Netherlands, England, since the early Middle Ages, the middle Middle Ages. So you have these new, you know, what Joseph Kaplan called new Jews, these communities made up of Spardim, ex-conversos, depending on what we want to call them, so that's one side of it, which is just fascinating, all amazing. And then the fact that, you know, these these mostly Portuguese Jews, but these new Jews, these ex-conversos create really a, a commercial empire that is so successful, so dominant that they are literally competing with the greatest empires of the time, England, uh, France, you know, the Netherlands. Uh, even though they have no territory of their own, they have no real unified political structure. It's astonishing. And then the whole uh, other side, which I find fascinating, is obviously the context of all of that is, uh, you know, European overseas expansion, it's colonization, it's slavery. This is uh, really, you could argue, this is the beginning of globalization in a certain way. This is the beginning of the world that we that we live in, the world as we know it, you know, multicultural, multinational, uh, of global expanse. Um, and And then you have the whole ethnic side of it. Uh, the, the question of of the meeting of all of these peoples who have never even known of each other's existence, uh, figuring out this whole kind of racial and religious hierarchy, it's it's a an incredibly turbulent, disturbing, amazing time, and and 
you know, I, again, it's it's really astonishingly modern. You read about the 17th century, and it's not in certain ways so distant from the 20th, 21st century in, in certain respects. So that's the other side of it. And then in terms of Montezinos, you know, he obviously is dealing with uh, the topic that brought me here today. You know, these, these amazing, uh, uh, this rhetoric, this discourse about things like the Lost Ten Tribes, the coming of the Messiah, uh, the, the kind of restitution of uh, and redemption of the people of Israel. And, and here, you know, all of that, which is interesting enough on its own, now takes on the hues of the surrounding uh, places and, and times, which is, you know, this whole ethnic racial uh, kind of turbulence. So I just find that all incredibly compelling and, and riveting. Okay, so I thank you for that background. And that's something we're going to dive into more. Like I already mentioned, listeners may be familiar with some of the story we went into the relation with Professor Ronnie Perellis, who you do discuss in this chapter. But let's 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 recap, because I think it's good for the episode to stand on its own a little bit. Let's recap Montezino's, you know, the story, the relation, the story, as it's related sure. in Menashe ben Israel's Mikvah Yisrael, Hope of Israel. And, and that, that's where that is. We can talk a little bit as publication history as well. And then we can get into back into what you were talking about. It's context, the background, the setting okay. in the mid 17th century. Great. So let's talk, a, if you want to just explain the relation, uh, talk about it a little bit, the text itself. Great. You probably know it as well as I do by now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, with pleasure. It, uh, it, it's a fascinating text. I, I find very brief, really a handful of pages. Um, it seems to be a, uh, a recording of, a transcription of paraphrase of testimony that he gave Antonio de Montezinos, who had taken on the Jewish name of Aaron Levy. Uh, he was of Portuguese background, um, and he came to Amsterdam in, um, I want to say, 1644, and kind of created a stir there. Uh, people were fascinated, apparently, by his stories of having uh, traveled in Nueva Granada, you know, one of the Spanish territories in uh, South America, what we would call today Colombia, um, more or less. And he claims to have met uh, people from the Lost Ten Tribes. So he related his story, and this relation, this relation is uh, the result of it. So the story is basically he's he's there, he's a merchant, he's um, doing his business there in, um, you know, Nueva Granada, New Granada, uh, named obviously after the southern uh, Spanish province. And um, he is he he is uh, doing his business with some Native Americans, and the Native Americans are complaining about the Spanish, how cruel they are, how brutal they are, and how much the natives suffer under them. Uh, he's sort of intrigued. Uh, he def he sort of defends the Spanish a little bit, but not wholeheartedly. He th he's then arrested by the Inquisition. All of a sudden, he's let go a few days later uh, for lack of evidence. Um, and he's still intrigued by what he has heard by from these Native Americans, particular the one leader of this little group that he's been working with or that they've been helping him, Francisco. Uh, and he goes back uh, to, to meet him and he finds him and Francisco proceeds to tell him this whole kind of fascinating uh, tale of this people that that lives uh, sort of amidst the Native Americans, but doesn't really relate to them, and they don't, they're not, they're not connected really to each other, but his, Francisco's people have these relations, there's a relationship with these other hidden people, and as it turns out, they are supposedly descended from the tribe of Ruvain, of Ruben. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, our our hero, our protagonist is, is amazed, uh, incredulous, and uh, begs Francisco to, to take him to, to meet them. And they go and they have this whole uh, encounter, which is almost like at the foot of a mountain, um, which is almost like the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. And he gets to meet these representatives, not really in depth and not really in person so much, but he hears this whole kind of revelation from them, this whole kind of... Um, uh, uh, communication from them, a day long communication, and and they have all kinds of things that they uh, convey to him, and he uh, he wants to know more. He tries to cross the river that's separating him from them, and doesn't quite do it. But in the end, what what he's what is revealed to him by Francisco, uh, as much as by these Reubenites themselves, is that uh, they will come out of hiding at a certain point, and they will really. Uh, overthrow the Spanish, 
they will uh, unite, kind of ally with the Native Americans, and they will restore the Jews, and everything will be good. So this is just a, you know, a, a wonderful new installation, if you will, a wonderful new episode in this whole Lost Ten Tribes history. Um, so that's kind of the relation itself. As I said, again, it's very short, a few pages. And Menashe ben Israel, who meets uh, Aaron Levy or Antonio de Montezinos in Amsterdam, is very, very, seemingly very, very uh, convinced by him. Uh, finds him a credible witness, finds him a credible source, and he takes this text and he uses it as the kind of introduction to his whole very famous book from 1650, Mikveh Yisrael, Esperanza de Israel, The Hope of Israel. And there's a lot we can say, we can talk about that, the relationship between the text of Montezinos and Menashe ben Israel's text, which is rather very different. Um, and Menashe has his own purposes in writing his text. But really, in some main sense, uh, what Menashe is trying to do in his, te in his text is unpack the relationship between Jews and Native Americans, right? There's a lot of mythology circulating around at the time that the Native Americans descend from the Jews, perhaps even from the Lost Ten Tribes. And so Menashe is trying to weigh in on that. And he's also trying to weigh in on a question that is um, intriguing and uh, kind of exciting. A lot of Christian uh, millenarians, uh, sort of, you know, Christians looking to the end of days um, in England, and they have their own theories about who the Native Americans are and what the discovery of these new worlds over on the other side of the Atlantic mean for European history, for the history of the Christians. Uh, and Menashe essentially uh, throws, out, throw down, throws down the gauntlet and, and says, well, I'm going to enter your debate and discussion, and I'm going to show you that here's the real relationship, right? Uh, the Jews are not the, the, the Native Americans, and the Native Americans do not derive from the Jews. Um, but perhaps there is some other kind of meaningful uh, hidden relationship. And I would argue that the Mikveh Yisrael, the, the text of Menashe ben Israel on a whole, some scholars say that he wrote it in order to convince Cromwell to readmit the Jews to England. And that's that's perfectly plausible. I feel that the, the text of Menashe ben Israel is a pretty uh, overtly Jewish text. It's pretty overtly arguing a kind of Jewish redemption, Jewish Messiah. You could almost argue a kind of Jewish proto-Zionism in a certain limited respect. So I, I, I don't know how it would have convinced Cromwell to, you know, let the Jews back into England. Um, I, I think it was more part of Menashe ben Israel's kind of theopolitics, if you will. Um, let me just leave it at that because, you know, we'll we'll get back into all kinds of related things. Yeah, we'll get back to Menashe. So, but one thing to ask about Menashe right away is Montezinos. So, the text as we have it in in the various editions, it comes from Mikveh Israel, right? We don't have, as you said, it wasn't a text; it was related over, it was a transcript or set over, whatever it was. We don't, so we know it through Menashe's words, uh, essentially. Mm -hmm. So, right. uh, not 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 saying that he altered it, but that's how we have it. Uh, and something else, you know, there's interesting uh, things about it is, as you as you said, he, you know, there was this question of the Native Americans, where they descended of the Jews of those tribes. And the Relacion and, and Menashe's work with Israel is very clear that they're not. It's saying that there were amongst the Native Americans hidden. And not only that, uh, Montezinos is very clear that it's just Ruvain. He's not mentioning the other tribes, which is interesting. Yeah, it's all every everything, almost everything about these texts is interesting. Yeah. The text we only have from Menashe in Israel, that's true. I did find, uh, you know, the appendix, uh, which I might not have sent you, um, but the appendix, I did find a, a letter in Italian uh, from Montezinos to uh, Avram Pereira, Eli, Elias Pereira, but who I think is Avram Pereira, very well-known, very famous, really well, probably one of the wealthiest uh, of the members of the Sparta community in Amsterdam, although he was in if it's the same person the, the, who the recipient was in Italy at the time. But so that that's the only ex, uh, autonomous version of the text that, that I know of. Um, but I 
don't believe that Menashe ben Israel wrote the text. I mean, I find it a little bit hard to believe. It, it would mean that he's really in, engaged in a kind of forgery. Um, I don't think there was any need for him to do that. The text is is what it is, and it it is absolutely typical of that genre of reports about lost tribes and that genre of travel writing. Uh, I think Menashe ben Israel makes a, good, a lot of use of it. I think he finds it very convenient for his own purposes, uh, but but I don't think there's enough evidence to prove one way or the other who actually wrote the text. And it's very possible that Menachem ben Israel helped edit it, you know, helped curate it, as we would say today. Um, now the other, yeah. So the 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 peoples that he meets are not Native Americans. These Reubenite tribes, these lost ten tribes, are hidden among. The Native Americans, and that too is absolutely in fitting with uh, all of the reports going back to El Dad Hadani. Uh, uh, anyone who reports about the Lost Ten Tribes, they're always living among these peoples in some exotic location, but they never mingle with them. It's another example of uh, you know uh, showing the importance of Jewish purity. Right. Jews don't, you know, intermingle. They don't lose their lashon their They don't intermarry. They don't lose their names, as we say about another very particular form of exile in Egypt. Right. So so that is totally in fitting with the, the whole genre. Um, and there, too, that's why I say that Menashe ben Israel's text is very Jewish. In other words, he's basically throwing it back in the in the in the faces of the, his Christians interlocutors and saying, that's all sweet. You believe that the natives descend from the Jews, but here's why they don't. And in fact, one of Menashe ben Israel's arguments is, is rather racist, right? Or certainly racialist. He says, listen, the Jews are all good looking. They're all comely and handsome and the natives are not. They're ugly. You know, they're again, they're kind of savages. So that's Menashe ben Israel's way of saying there's no connection. Don't imagine that there's a connection. Um, and you know, the reason Christians were imagining that connection fits into their own messianic, you know, eschatological schema, right? If the Native Americans are parts of the Lost Ten Tribes, right, and they can be claimed or reclaimed for Christianity, then that's another beautiful instance of the conversion of the Jews, right? So that makes a lot of sense if you're a Catholic or, an, or a Protestant. And what Manasseh ben Israel is saying is no, 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 no. The Native Americans may hate the Spanish. They may be oppressed by the Spanish. They may want to uh, rise up and overthrow you, and maybe they will, but that none of that means that they're Jews. What it does mean is that there is a parallelism there is a shared political, or again, we could say theopolitical interests that both Jews and Native Americans share, which is the hatred of uh, Christian imperialism and oppression and intolerance and so on. And and again, I, I would argue that's a pretty uh, assertive argument for the 17th century for Benasha ben Israel to make, especially given his, his, his known... Um, proclivity to to friendships and uh, communications with Christians. And he did. He, he was very interested in that and he benefited from it and he was very interested in upholding a Jewish voice. And here we see that 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 his friendship and the, all these communications did not mean that he was lowering the standards of what he felt were kind of presenting the Jew, Jewish arguments, you know. Okay, and maybe we'll get back to more Menashe at the end. So I want to get back to, to Montezinos and the Relacion. So you, 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 know, you said at the beginning, the whole background, the backdrop of what was going on with these Western Sephardim, with the Amsterdam Jewish community, the former conversos, uh, Spanish-Portuguese Jews, and what's going on in the colonial world. Where does, where does the Relacion and the Montezinos fit in there? How does this story about the lost tribes, you know, the Rubenites, where, from Montezinos' angle, not, you know, we mentioned kind of Menashe's thing, but from Montezinos, where does this fit into that world? It fits into it absolutely perfectly. I mean, you know, we have to remember that there was messianic speculation always among Jews. And when you have this new population of, of 
forcibly converted Jews who are called new Christians, who are called new Christians for hundreds of years, even if their family was converted five, seven generations earlier, right? It's it's a real, it's a crazy instance of kind of racialism, you know, you cannot, you cannot ever leave or escape your Jewishness, even when you become Christian. So among the conversos, there was immense messianic speculation for 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 even more obvious reasons, right? Um, now it's not only that the Jews are oppressed, but now you have these these Jews who have been forced to become Christians, and they they were many of them uh, who you know on the one hand you have many who were fine being Christians now maybe, but many of them were <laughs> incredibly uh, distressed and unhappy and and had no interests in, in in being Christian, right? So they maintained their Jewish loyalties. They maintained as best they could Jewish practices, Jewish knowledge. So you have all kinds of instances of uh, mysticism and messianic speculation among the conversos. You have women uh, kind of prophets, you know, who are interpreting dreams or relating their own visions and dreams. Uh, and you have many conversos reporting to the Inquisition or or to others, uh, their own uh, visions of uh, the coming of the Messiah is going to you know make them Jews again, bring them out from under the oppressive yoke of the Catholics, uh, and and possibly even bring them back to the Holy Land. Um, and there are many many examples of that. Uh, so by the time you get to Montezinos, uh, and we know nothing about his background, uh, we know his father's name. I have tried to. Put together a genealogy for him, but was absolutely unable to do so. It could very well be that he's related to some of the other Montezinoses who are around in the 17th century, some of whom are quite wealthy uh, uh, merchants. Um, but I was not able to really figure out who he is. We know nothing about his background before this relation. He shows up in Amsterdam kind of out of the blue. He goes, he he was on the way to Brazil, but he decided to come to Amsterdam instead, but he leaves Amsterdam within two years. He goes to Brazil. He dies uh, three years after that. And that's about all we know about him. Um, there's one essay about him by a descendant of the family. Uh, they have some family traditions, which she reports on, which are kind of interesting. But yeah, there's like, like so many figures from that period. There's just a, much more that we don't know than what we do know. But so his relation is, is, clearly picking up on these th these discourses about the lost tribes right that the lost tribes are there waiting uh and when they're given the signal they are going to sweep out uh and they're incredibly um uh skilled warriors uh and their large numbers of soldiers will be the uh force that basically saves Israel. And they will, again, overthrow the Christians. And there are different versions of it, obviously, but they will restore the Jews to sovereignty. They will restore the Jews to the Holy Land. Uh, and we will be entering the Messianic days. So for Montezinos, as a converso, if he had Jewish knowledge, if he had uh, loyalties and practiced any anything Jewish, this would have been a, a narrative that would have really cheered him up, would have would have given him courage and hope and made him feel that there's a future, you know, that it's, all is not lost, God has not abandoned us, uh, and we will escape, we will be liberated from this horrible condition. So it makes total sense, right? Now, again, as I said, what's so wonderful in, to me about his text is how that whole long-standing discourse about the lost and tribes is now mapped onto this new discourse based on European overseas expansion and, and colonization with all kinds of new peoples, ethnicities, and races. And he finds in these Native Americans a kind of incredible mirror a, a distorting mirror, of course, but an incredible mirror that reflects on the situation of the conversos. It, it parallels it. It's also somewhat different from it. And then you have this mythological people that somehow hidden away uh, in the middle of the Americas, right? That they are the lost 10 tribes. And again, for Montezinos, it serves an incredible purpose. The Native Americans hate the Spanish, they're going to overthrow them. But if the Native Americans weren't in theory powerful enough, 
after all, that was still it was still a fairly large uh, population that that outnumbered the Spanish in the 17th century, and there were long-standing, ongoing Spanish fears of rebellion uh, by Native Americans, which is easy to understand given the way they were treated uh, and the way they were uh, colonized and taken over. Uh, but there's another people even more powerful, which is this hidden Rubenite people. And so Montezinos gets to subvert, overturn all of these Catholic, Spanish and Portuguese imaginings and narratives about the significance of the discovery of the Americas, right? Narratives that, for instance, said that the Americas were God's gift to uh, Spain and Portugal, right? That this was a kind of promised land, almost, that God was giving to them, right? And that the uh, discovery of the Americas and the conquest of the Americas was, again, another sign of God's favor toward the Spaniards and Portuguese. And since the Catholic Church was the, the real Israel, the new Israel, all of this shows that it all justifies and legitimates uh, the Catholic self-image, right? We are the favored people. We are the chosen people. We are the new Israel. And God is favoring us with uh, this incredible empire in which we are doing God's work by converting these uh, uncivilized savages uh, to, you know, the, the true uh, religion. So Montezinos gets to subvert all of that by using a lot of the elements of those narratives, right? The Americas as the kind of utopia, Americas as a kind of Garden of Eden, uh, the natives as this uh, exotic people whose uh, identity is somewhat unclear, and especially as it relates to uh, Catholics and Portuguese, uh, and it, the, it, Montezinos gets to subvert the the the, the self image of the Spanish and Portuguese as the new Israel, and he he gets to do all of that by using their own language against them, as it were, right? Their own narratives against them. So again, there too, it it must have been it must have felt to him like an incredibly potent mixture rhetorically, um, you know. And we we have to we have to remember, I think that. Many, many people back then, listen, it's still true today, but even more so, many people back then believed in these kinds of things. People thought mythologically. Um, they were not all rationalists. They were not all scientists. And these kinds of narratives, these kinds of stories can can have incredible, powerful uh, impact and, and be incredibly assuaging and comforting, you know. And that's something that I want to pick up on as well. Something you mentioned a little bit before about the converso, his converso background and uh, converso hopes. I mean, where does that fit into this picture? The the converso hopes. We we were. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, we can as Jews imagine. Obviously, right? Your identity is stolen from you. You're forced to be a member of another religion that you had no interest in, right? Um, your your whole way of life is now changed. You're you you're now living in incredibly um, oppressive circumstances where you can't really be yourself. Um, you're, you're not allowed to circulate with uh, your own people. You're not allowed to speak uh, the language that you knew. I mean, not that so many of them spoke Hebrew, but, you know, they, they might have been praying in Hebrew as Jews before they converted, right? So you're not allowed to pray in your language. You're not allowed to, to practice your own religion. So the converso population it's a whole long topic of conversation. And it's probably true that there were a good percentage of conversos who were fine being Catholics. You know, they went along with it and maybe they even liked it. It gave them social advantages, economic advantages. You know, there was probably uh, also a large population of the conversos um, that d was very confused about religion. You know, they practiced some kind of mixture of Christianity and, and Judaism. There's probably another part of the Converso population that didn't care for religion at all and saw it all as very problematic, especially in this era of, you know, this the crazy Inquisition, right? Um, but then you have a part of the Converso population that cares deeply about their background. They know that they're Jewish. They feel Jewish. They are not interested in giving that up. And in fact, in some way, even more so, right? You know, Adaraba, right? The, the whole Inquisition and the forced conversion made them even prouder to be Jews. It made them care even more about Jewishness. Uh, and so Converso hopes were 
uh, you know, in some sense, almost kind of a more simply a more concentrated form of Jewish hopes. Uh, very, very similar yearning for liberation, learning for uh, freedom, learning to be able to be themselves, learning, yearning to be able to live according to their uh, traditions and their ways, uh, which they thought were given by God. So, I mean, they, they were absolutely uh, uh, similar to what most Jews have yearned for historically, without, without being forcibly converted. But this added dimension, I think, gave Converso hopes and yearnings a particular um, urgency, a particular poignancy. There was something even more tragic and, and absurd and surreal about the Converso predicament, uh, I think, than the Jewish predicament in general. Uh, so, yeah, I think they, they were very, very prone to... Um, messianic beliefs you know i've seen i mean in mexico there was a circle in the 17th century there was a circle of conversos who believed that one of the children born to one of the women was going to be the messiah and that was not so uncommon uh they this was really lived religion you know we're keeping in mind that conversos did not have access to most conversos did not have access to the texts of judaism uh, they, they couldn't have read them anyway, but they didn't know from rabbinic Judaism. They they cobbled together whatever they could, mostly based on Christian sources, interestingly. So a lot of converso religiosity actually seems very Catholic, which is which it is in some way. And and I, I will relate back to my previous series on Shabbos Tzvi is that this is kind of a precursor here. We're like 16 years before Shabbos Tzvi, and this is a community. Although Rabbi Yaakov supports us, will live here, and he's one of the he's the you know main vocal outspoken critic or the one standing against Shabtai Tzvi, but Sabatianism really sweeps this community. They all get swept up. Now, what does this, what does the Relacion and, and Mikvah Israel have and Manasha have to do with Sabatianism is another question. What is yeah. that, what kind of impact does this have on that? But like right. you're saying, the Messianism plays a big part here in these conver in these Converso's background. A, a huge part. And Shabtai Tzvi, of course, comes from the um, Converso community in Turkey. And that's not a coincidence, right? He's steeped in Kabbalah, uh, you know, and Kabbalah is often seen as a Mediterranean kind of Sephardic thing, although it was not, of course. Um, and there are certain similarities. Shabtai Tzvi was very himself, very influenced by, uh, well, well, him, he, Natan of Gaza, and the whole kind of structure of, of Sabbateanism is influenced very much by Catholic narratives, you know. So, for instance, this whole this whole idea of Yeridal Torah you know, that the Shabbat Tzvi has to go down and descend into the depths of sin in order to redeem himself and everyone else is really this, the narrative of Jesus, right? Uh, uh, and the Jesus' incarnation. And Menashe, uh, and sorry, Montezinos is, is playing with this too, right? A lot of the converso messianism plays on the converso predicament. In other words, the Messiah, of course, Dafka will come out from this hidden uh, identity, from this hidden location, because that's what the converso represents. The converso was someone who could not be himself or herself, and whose identity and, and real nature was forced to be uh, suppressed and kind of become subterranean. So it, it makes a lot of sense that you see among conversos belief in messianic children, right? Very Christ-like. Um, you know, the women were the leaders in converso religiosity. Um, it seems very obvious that a lot of the converso spirituality was was actually kind of about or similar to uh, worship yeah, I don't say worship, but, you know, adulation of the Virgin Mary. So, I, I mean, it's fat. It's, again, very syncretistic. The, they, they didn't know better. They didn't have access to the sources. Right. So they did the best they could. So the Shabtai Tzvi episode is very, very much connected with this. Um, listen, that Shabtai Tzvi, that's why he got in, into trouble with the Sultan. You know, the Sultan said, I don't want you agitating my Jews and getting them all excited and hopeful about messianic uh, possibilities. Montezinos is essentially trying to do the same thing. He's trying to stir up the Jews and tell them, wow, listen, I found the lost 10 tribes. I found at least the tribe of Reuben and they are powerful and they are our allies. They're waiting for the signal. Don't lose hope. We're we're going to come out of this alive and on top. And not, and I, you know, I want to emphasize that not only will the these Reubenites 
help the Jews escape their their being dominated and escape their oppression, but Jews then will be the winners. Jews afterwards, through, with the lost tribes people, will come out on top. In other words, they will have sovereignty, they will be in control. Very different than Rambam's perception of the Messianic period, for instance. This is a very real political uh, narrative, you know. This is not just, we're going to be living in a in a in an era where there's no sin and there, and and everyone follows God's word and you know there's uh, Dat Elohim as the prophets say. No, this is also a kind of uh, overturning of the tables and Jews will now be in control and will dominate. So again, super comforting, super um, enticing to anyone who feels, wow, we've been stamped on, we've been trod upon, and uh, how horrible that is, you know. So is that how you mainly view the Relacion and its view of the Ten Tribes, or again, mainly Ruvain here, is that it's a messianic text? Yes, yes, it's absolutely. It's a messianic text. It's meant to give comfort and hope to the Jews and or the conversos, uh, to, give, to give them strength, right, chizuk. Uh, and and to, to tell them not to despair. Yeah, absolutely. It's also a way of saying, you know, this whole discovery of this new world is not insignificant. It was for a reason. And it will bring us good things, right? Not only is the new world someplace that maybe you could flee to escape the Inquisition, Maybe it's not, the Inquisition in, indeed followed uh, the conversos to the New World uh, in many respects. But not only was the New World a place you could maybe get away from oppression, but it was also a place that was now going to provide the means for the complete overturning of Jewish downtroddenness. So I want to talk just a, a little bit more. I mean, there's a lot you, you go through in your lengthy, again, chapter, essay, whatever. You go through a lot of, you know, in the text, you discuss a lot of things that goes on in this, in this short text of Montezino. You know, so we can discuss a, a little bit about it. I, I first want to ask you, we, you, we I called it the relation, you said it's a relation. What does that mean, especially as compared to other forms of histor history or uh, Right. I'm just using the English term. I mean, relacion is fine. That's the Spanish and Portuguese term. Relação is Portuguese, right? Uh, relations, the uh, relaciones back then were uh, a genre of report, often reports sent back for official purposes to the monarch uh, or other authorities, but they were also per often personal um, uh, reports, and they were often also very... Um, particular uh, reports that had to do with very specific situations, right? And they were usually very short. Uh, they were usually not long. They were not chronicles, right? Um, and and they were often very partisan, right? Uh, so they were written for usually official purposes and to kind of um, give news or give an update about a specific place or or sort of circumstances. Um, so in this case, I'm not really sure what to make of that. In other words, is this really an official report? Uh, perhaps because he, uh, Montezinos, gave over the report in public or, or to private audiences and perhaps private authorities in Amsterdam, it sort of became a re relacion. Um, but it's clearly also a very personal uh, uh, report also. And, and there, too, I want to say, going back to what we were just talking about previously, yes, I think this is an eminently political text. It's an eminently messianic text. But I also think there's a, a wonderful, a wonderfully rich amount of uh, subjectivity there. This is really a kind of personal uh, statement. Um, it's a confused, uh, kind of convoluted, perhaps even slightly insane um, statement, but it's a statement of of his own wrestling with his identity. And that's something that uh, Pirellis goes into uh, a lot in his reading of the text, um, reading it internally to the text itself and reading it as a psychological, emotional document relating both to Montezinos as a person, but also to Montezinos as a converso. 
And I, I think he does a beautiful reading of it. I think it's a great approach to the text. And I'm trying to add to it by, by looking at the outside context also, what's outside of the text. But I think that's part of what makes this text so um, believable to many readers. But also it lends the text a kind of um, multidimensionality, which, which removes it from the genre of just being a purely kind of messianic, a fevered, you know, messianic uh, speculation. This is also a text with a kind of human depth to it, a human richness. And I think it probably resonated a lot with the readers or the hearers of it, who themselves might have come to a place like Amsterdam as conversos, or they still have family members who are conversos in, in the Iberian Peninsula or in the Americas. I think this was something that really spoke to them also. You know, this whole episode where he's in the uh, in Inquisition jails and he makes this blessing, you know, he he's sort of wrestling with, with his own identity. Who am I? Who are these Native Americans? Are they Jews? They hate the Spaniards. Oh, you know, we hate the Spaniards too. Um, am I Spanish? Am I an anti-Spaniard because I'm a converso? What? Where am I? Who am I? Very relatable. Really very relatable. This is the converso predicament. Uh, and then he comes up with this blessing. Fascinating blessing that we could talk about textually, where what the sources are. Thank God that you didn't make me a, a barbarian, right? An Indian or a black. Uh, again, absolutely right out of that time and place where all of these wrestlings with what identity means, what your background means, what your genealogy means, what your race means, who gets to call you what, do you determine your own identity, do other people who dominate over you determine your identity, et cetera, et cetera. So I feel like that's important because if this were just another messianic text, okay, wonderful. It's another messianic text. That's not, not unimportant, but this becomes something more. Now you say this would resonate. This text did and would resonate with the reader or the listener at the time period. Are there familiarities? Were there other texts like this, whether from conversos or from others of the time period? Oh, many, many texts. They're circulating all over the place. People loved it. People loved this stuff. <laughs> um, you know, you have conversos. You have people who weren't conversos. Uh, promulgating this stuff. Um, you know, there were Christian versions of it that Jews were probably exposed to. There were Jewish versions of it uh, that they were exposed to. You know, the whole myth of Prester John, the whole myth of uh, this, this Christian king who lives in the midst of, again, far and distant uh, peoples is taken right out of the, the mythology of the Lost Ten Tribes. You have this whole Portuguese version, Sebastianismo, uh, based on this, uh, the, the uh, Portuguese um, uh, king uh, who, who died in 1581 uh, um, in, a, in a battle in Morocco, and uh, he became a kind of messianic figure for many Portuguese. Uh, people ate this stuff up. Ordinary life was difficult, complicated, violent, short, uh, you know, even though we we know that the West, Western Sephardim in places like Amsterdam and London, Curaçao and Suriname uh, were in the scheme of things phenomenally wealthy, some of them, the, the communities were overwhelmingly poor. And, uh, you know, these kinds of narratives gave people a lot of comfort and hope that, that you know, their own personal lives might not be so, so good, but collectively, God has not abandoned them. God is still with them and, and things will change. So, yeah, they, they, they were all over the place. You know, Shlomo Molcho's uh, sermons, you know, Shlomo Molcho, who is the right-hand man, secretary or partner of David Haruveni, a whole other fascinating episode. Um, his sermons were reprinted in Amsterdam. Um, among the many, many things printed in the 17th century in Amsterdam were a lot of messianic uh, speculation uh, texts, a lot of messianic texts. And, you know, Amsterdam, the Amsterdam community of Svartim was one of the places where support for Shabtai Tzvi was incredibly strong. So, yes, it, it all makes a lot of sense. Okay, so the text itself, now, 
there's a bunch you go very in depth in here and I did some with Professor Perales and we're not going to sit here you know the whole text but there is you know interesting you mentioned the blessing there's the speech of the Reubenites give uh, right, very, right. he says come back come back with I think 12 people right there's yeah. an also the I think I don't know if I'm pronouncing it the Mohanes the Mohanes however he pronounces them right, are the right. priests or magicians I don't know which part you want to speak right. about you can right. talk about any of this they're all it's fascinating I find it fascinating. I find it fascinating. What I do, Bakitsur, I mean, in, in some, what I try to do in my analysis is take the text and not just say it's fantasy and not just say it's bizarre and warped, which it might well be, but try to understand it on its own terms. And therefore, I try to ask a lot of questions about it. Okay, he purports to be have been in Nueva Granada. He purports to have circulated with all these Native Americans and to have met this, these Reubenites. Let's look at the text. Let's look at the details. And and does it resonate at all with what we know about Native Americans in the 17th century? There are many, many, many writings from Spaniards about the Native Americans, uh, among other things. So let's compare and contrast and see if that gets us any closer to understanding the text and understanding whether it's coherent, understanding whether that might be factual or whatever. So, right, the, the whole meeting with the Reubenites is amazing. They they have nine points, almost like nine commandments that are numbered in the text, and they convey them this whole kind of, uh, again, revelation from these Reubenites and, and fascinating elements to it, right? Um, the Reubenites don't have interaction with the Native Americans only once every 70 uh, every 70 months uh, is their connection. Uh, they're actually not allowed to really hang out with each other. Um, and uh, we also, yes, want you to send us 12 people with beards, 12 men with beards who can write things down. Um, Joseph, you know, lives in the middle of the sea. Who this Joseph is, is something I ask about. Um, right. And they, you know, said, insist at the end, don't try to find us. You know, we, you can't really access us. Um, so it's this revelation that's also quite uh mystifying <laughs> and there's a lot there that's unknown um you know we're told about uh, the negotiations between that we're told the history of the not actually we're told that at a later period a later uh sorry episode uh where i think francisco or tells uh uh or someone else tells uh, montezinos more you know the whole history of how these rubenites came to the the, uh, the Latin South America, there were all these wars. At, at first, the Indians were against the Reubenites and tried to uh, fight them, but the Reubenites were so powerful and such good warriors that the, in, the Native Americans always lost. And finally, they said, well, let's make an alliance with them. And all the negotiations between the Reubenites and the Native Americans were conducted by a woman. When I look into that, what, what does that mean? What's the, what's going on there? Um, and the the advisors, the, the leaders of the Native Americans, the Mohanes, these these right magicians, shamans, chiefs, leaders, warriors, um, is that, that's a term used by Montezinos. And so again, I try to say, oh, well, if he's using all of these, giving us all these descriptions of how the Reubenites, the Reubenites dressed. Um, so what can we say about that based on what we know about the state of Native Americana at the time? So let's just talk with uh, talk about a few things, right? It was very common for women to be the negotiators uh, for some of these Native American peoples. So it's very possible that the fact that uh, Montezinos has a woman being the negotiator between the Native Americans uh, and the Reubenites reflect some kind of knowledge on his part that he knew enough from circulating there personally or from what he read or was told about things uh, there in Nueva Granada and makes use of it, you know. Um, the Mohanas, right, are the, the shamans, the magicians, the leaders, and we know from a lot of the history of the time uh, and place that the Mohanas were often very, very anti-Spanish. They were the ones who were concerned with keeping the native practices, keeping the native religions. They were often the leaders of the resistance against the Spaniards. So here, too, it's I find it interesting that the, the Mohanas, uh, he knows the term, he uses it. He, he sees them as the wise leaders who tell the Native Americans eventually, we have to stop fighting the Reubenites. It's bad and we're not going to win. And these are actually people who are potentially going to help us. Um, and here, too, you know, there's a sense that, that that he 
uses the term because it fits into this whole narrative that he's trying to weave together of how the natives side with the Reubenites against the Spaniards. And that, that is an alliance that is going to uh, come out uh, to all of our benefits at the end of days. So, so you know, the Jews and the Native Americans really become like brothers, they become allies. Uh, and that's, of course, how the, the Relacion ends, right? The final revelation is where uh, these Reubenites tell, the, the, the Native Americans tell um, Montezinos, um, you know, we're going to emerge at a certain point. You won't exactly recognize us, but we will be allies. We will be your brothers, kind of. And it's a, it's a it's an alliance of mutual assistance. Uh, and here too, it's 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 um, it's it's fascinating. I mean, here, here's this converso using this this huge people, much much larger than the Jews. Right, the, the, this, the, all of these Native American peoples and using them, projecting onto them a kind of narrative usefulness in Jewish messianic terms, in Jewish mass, in a Jewish messianic sense. Um, so there too, he's overturning the Christian narrative and saying, no, no, the Native Americans are in fact going to be part of the messianic story, but they're our allies, actually. <laughs> they're not going to become part of you. In fact, the opposite, right? So. You know, ultimately, I don't know whether I could not decide that Montezinos really was there. I couldn't decide that he really met all of these Native American peoples. I certainly can't decide that he met uh, members of one of the Lost Ten Tribes. But it does seem that if you read the text carefully, his usage of his knowledge of what we could call local color is enough to convince me that he was there physically, he was there personally, he learned about the context and terrain in the large, in the wider sense, he knew about it. Um, I am convinced that he believed that there was veracity and accuracy to all of this. Um, I can't necessarily corroborate that, but I think it's important, uh, you know, to be able to say that. Um, and especially given the Italian version of this letter that I found, of this relation that I found, in which many of the details are the same, um, I I'm convinced that he was there, that he knew enough about the local surroundings to weave together a pretty convincing text, one that was uh, based on a real experience. Um, that doesn't answer the question of whether it's fantasy or not, but... I think at the time, the, the, the border between fantasy and fact was quite fuzzy. Uh, and many, he, he would certainly not be the only Jew or converso who, who kind of um, wanted to be on both sides of that boundary between fact and fantasy. So, as I said, it's included in Menashe is the one who kind of includes it, sends it around. He has it to make for Israel, but before that, he sends it to Thomas Thorogood, right, and John Dury, and they have it. Uh, yeah. What kind of is the, the reception history of Montezinos and then throughout the centuries of this relation? Uh, I think the reception history of Montezinos, which is not necessarily the reception history of the Mikveh Israel, um, I think some of the non-Jews who read it were quite taken with it. Um, you know, Montezinos doesn't really, Montezinos' text, unlike the Mikveh Israel, he's not making a series of arguments, right? It's not an analytical text. It's a, it's a narrative. It's a personal kind of fantasy narrative. And, and, you know, it's intriguing. At the same time, obviously, from a Christian perspective, you know, it's, it's, um, it's completely, um, what's the word? Um, it's completely, um, you know, heretical in the sense that it's it's so obviously giving over a Jewish perspective on it. And I think most of the Christians who read it did not take that well. You know, in other words, they said, oh, this is nonsense. How dare you? No, no, no. This is not the way it's going to work out uh, when the Messiah comes. And, uh, and, I, and I think most Jewish readers, I think many of the as as is so often the case, you know, there's a split between the elite intellectuals 
and the masses of the people. And I think a lot of Jews took this text to be very comforting and very convincing. And then a lot of the intellectuals minimized it and said, yeah, yeah, well, whatever, you know, um, nice, nice try. Uh, so I think the reception history of it is on the whole uh, negative. I think most people dismissed it. But, you know, the way I read McVeigh Israel and Menashe's writing in McVeigh Israel, I think Menashe himself was very convinced of the text's accuracy. He was convinced that Amantzinos was a credible witness. At least that's what he writes. You know, he says that a few times in a few different ways. We have no reason to doubt him. He 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 comes from a good family. He's credible as a witness. Um, so I think Menashe who himself, we know, had messianic uh, leanings. I think he really found this text very, very uh, convenient and useful. Okay, and like you said, it really is a uh, fantastical narrative, you know, well worth reading, um, which, which again, so there's the, I think there's the Hebrew edition of Mikveh Yisrael, which is in, there's the English edition, which is the 1652 translation. Is there really a newer mm -hmm. Edition translation for last year, and it's really kind of those old, older editions translation no, uh, of Montezinos's text. Yeah, Mont the Montezinos. Whole... No, Montezinos. no. What I will do now is I, I have I'm um, working on an essay about a different uh, episode uh, of uh, Sephardic colonization in 1658. There's a journey of a few ships that are bringing Sephardic settlers to a, a new Dutch colony in what's called the uh, Cayenne, uh, the Dutch uh, Essequibo, the Dutch wild coast, as it's called, um, and uh, near Suriname. And so when I finish that essay, what I am hoping to do is put out uh, the a new edition with the Montezinos essay, uh, this essay about the 1658 Essequibo journey, which also has a text to it. Um, and then I have another essay about another 17th century uh, Sephardic traveler from Amsterdam, uh, Moshe uh, Pereira de Paiva, who goes to India, to Cochin, and writes a very interesting little text about the Jews of Cochin. So I would like to publish those three essays, and I want to put uh, new translations of each of the original texts with with each of the essays. So I'm hoping to, you know, I don't know, next year, I will hopefully, God willing, um, but yeah, I think these texts are important to read. It's easy to dismiss them as sort of lunacy and fantasy, but I think they're very reflective of a very real uh, strand of Jewish thinking and Jewish life and experience of the time. Yeah, absolutely. They're really interesting. So, okay, so uh, now uh, let me just ask you in, in uh, you know, closing here, reading on, on uh, Montezinos, there's, you know, Professor Perales, we mentioned the previous episode. There's your now some of your your, your books were brilliant, they were expensive, but some of the books you've now redone and kind of they're <laughs> they're pretty affordable. I can link to those, but this is not available. Is this on Montezinos? Is this available anywhere? Your academia page, maybe where can anyone get this or they can't? It's I, I I mean I think the PDF is available online. You know, uh, academia.edu is the the source that uh, you know one is not supposed to mention that that has a lot of material. Um, but but yes, the Brill volume was actually put in. It was my, the, my Brill book that this essay appears in was actually made into two volumes, which uh, a decision I was not happy with, and it's very expensive, as you say. This essay does not appear in the reprints of, of uh, you know, the secret societies is, or underground societies is, is uh, one title, both put out by Marcus Wiener uh, in, in, out of New Jersey and Princeton. Um, but that has all the, the chapter, the materials on blacks and Africans who are, are enslaved uh, and none of the Native American stuff. So for now, yeah, it's uh, you, you people have to look online or take the book out of the library or encourage your library to order the book, Swimming in the Christian Atlantic, which I think has some fascinating material. I mean, I find this material just rich and compelling. Uh, I, there's two chapters of that of that um, book, the original Swimming in the Christian Atlantic book one of which deals with a, a converso in Cartagena de las Indias who's denounced by a slave uh, and a very colorful and crazy episode. And then another chapter about a converso woman who herself is of, of uh, half African descent uh, in Mexico City. And I want to, I would love to at some point turn each of those chapters into a mini series. I feel like they would make a 
great, you know, TV uh, treatment uh, kind of thing, because there's just so much uh, interpersonal, so much human conflict and politics, there's magic, there's sex, there's race, religion, it's it's I, I find it very uh, resonant. I mean, it's tragic stuff. It's sometimes hard to read, but uh, it's really uh, very real, I find. So anyway, yeah, I hope that's helpful for your readers, uh, for yeah. your, uh, listen, your listeners. Yeah. Yes, I'll, I'll link those in the show's notes as well, even though they're not specifically about this. And if I find, the, like I said, this on the academia, I will link this as well. So thank you, Professor Schwartz, for joining me. What a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Pleasure to talk with all of with with you about all of this. Thank you again.